Hello friends, Neil here, EMF Safety Zone Channel. I'm going to shoot a quick video here and give you some education on a really basic uh, subject, which is Bluetooth radiation. So this is a 27-inch monitor I have the camera pointed at here on a Mac computer. And as you can see here, I have the acoustometer. It's turned on. The volume is on. You can see when I turn it off, the display goes off. So I have it on. And in my office, obviously, I have no wireless radiation because I don't have any wireless devices activated. But let me show you a very simple thing that I think is rather profound. I'm going to turn the Bluetooth option on on my computer. And I want you to watch what happens here. Most people, I'm going to turn the volume down. Most people are sitting in front of their computer, their laptop or their computer, with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi activated, not knowing that radiation, wireless radiation, microwave radiation, is shooting through their body the entire time. Now you can see this is registering 5 to 10 microwatts per square meter average power density. The building biologists um, and the uh, bioinitiative report suggests that 3.4 microwatts per square meter um, creates biological consequences. And then on the left side of the meter, you see the peak signal strength going up to 0 0.20 volts per meter. And building biologists consider that 30 to 40 times more detrimental than the average. So again, all I did was activate the Bluetooth. If you didn't, I just turned the meter off. So if you don't have a meter, you can't see this. You don't even know what's happening. And most people are sitting in front of the Bluetooth activated like this all the time. When you have a meter, you can see that this microwave radiation is very real and it's in the environment. Let me deactivate the Bluetooth. That's another thing that scares me a little bit about these computers is I've just had to turn it off twice before it actually went off. And so here you can see in the meter that the Bluetooth is off and it's not radiating. So the message I'm trying to transmit here is go onto your computer, your laptop, or whatever computer you're using, even, even your tablets, and make sure Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is deactivated when you're not using it. All right, so here it is once again. I just activated the Bluetooth and you can see the meter jump up immediately. All right, thank you for watching. Hi, this is David with RadiationHealthRisks.com here to do another quick uh, radiation uh, test video. What we're going to test today is a couple of Bluetooth earbuds and then the uh, 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 Samsung uh, smartphone. So what we're going to use to test it, sorry for the review for those of you who have seen my other videos, this is a high frequency analyzer, measures up to 2000 microwatts per meter squared of RF or microwave radiation. Um, this model is a HF35C. I love it because it measures anything, uh, you're, like you'll see here in a minute, earbuds, the Bluetooth in your car, a smart meter, Wi-Fi, whatever you're worried about, how much radiation it puts off, this will measure it for you. It's not very expensive. Um, anyway, uh, so what we're going to do, uh, hang on just a second. I'm going to turn this on so you can see the difference when it happens. So... I'm going to let this, uh, when you first turn one of these meters on, it just kind of goes crazy and then it calms down to what's in the, in the room. So there you go. You can see it's about three, four, five, like that. So I'm going to set it here. And every once in a while it'll pick up something from, you know, we've got cell towers and other people's Wi-Fi that occasionally you get a little feedback from. My house is pretty, not too bad. So now I want, to, I want you to see this when I turn this on. 
just turning it on there it started going crazy and it's maxing out already hadn't even really look at there it's maxing out hadn't even really started yet hopefully you can see that when it's at one like that it's maxing out so I just want to that calms down for a minute and then again here in a second it'll kick back up as it's, there you go maxing out that's enough so what I wanted the reason I'd like to show you that now that's without making a call it puts out a lot more uh, your typical smartphone puts out a lot more radiation when it's actually making a call but that th this uh, like I said measures up to 2,000 microwatts per meter squared so when it maxes out like that it's getting more than twice the US safety limit uh, more than 2,000 microwatts uh, blasting so um, just uh, anyway we'll talk about that in a second so I want to try these earbuds here really quick notice this little screen this is kind of a handy thing I may do a review on it in a while this is something you can set your cell phone in just so that when it's near you it blocks most of the radiation they've got different sizes um, so anyway just put that in there okay so we're gonna test these earbuds these are Bluetooth earbuds hopefully the batteries charged up enough that there we go so you can hear that and you can see it's not maxing it out, but it's doing like 300. Ooh, 1300 there, 900. I don't know if you can see that. So, and that's without even making a call. That's just having the thing turned on. Both of these things just turned on. Turn that off so we don't get the interference, and we'll turn this off. So thing I want you to think about is your ears are a hole in your head so if you're gonna take something and put them in your ears I'm not saying your skull is a very good filter of radiation but you don't even have that as a filter between your brain and you just got soft tissue when you stick those things in your ears um, and if you there's people that wear those Bluetooth all the time they got that radiation just going right in their ears like that now um, when you've got your cell phone like this holding it to your head it's the exact same thing it's it's uh, just going through your skull and through your ears just right there uh, pelting you all the time the best alternative <clears throat> is to get some sort of a of a you know of a what do they call these things uh, head, headphones or whatever the uh, the problem with a corded one like this is this cord when you plug this into the base of your of your cell phone or smartphone it acts like an antenna and literally the radiation will just go right up the antenna right into your ear um, you know almost as bad or if, if not or similar to having a Bluetooth right there so um, they make what's called a, a, a air tube headset if you go to the recommended protections tab on on radiationhealthrisks.com website I show a couple of models there that I that I like. Um, the, what they are is from your earphones down to this middle part. They're uh, they're air tubes. Um, they're a little heavier, a little bulkier, but but you don't have the radiation coming up anywhere near your head. Only problem with them is you still have radiation in the cord down here from the middle where the two come together. Um, and if you're uh, the radiation if it's leaning against your body especially like with a pregnant woman the you know it's right there next to your 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 baby or your own body if you got that radiation just going right into your body um, so whether you get an air tube again the, the the air tube headsets are the best if you can deal with the weight um, or one of these but you need to get these things called ferrite beads that go that you can put on there they open up and you can wrap it through and put it on the bottom of like I did here on the bottom of the cord you really should have two of them I've got some more ordered I've given some of them away so I've got to get another one it's better to have a couple of them on here and you just put them right right above where it uh, plugs into the phone and uh, um, that cuts out most of the radiation here if you have a, a corded one you'll still have a little bit of radiation 
making it to your ear and they say no uh, level of radiation is technically safe but having a couple of these on there sure cuts down most of it um, or with the with the air tubes you won't have any uh, radiation making it to your head you'll still have some going by your body again even with an uh, air tube you're going to want a couple of ferrite beads down at the bottom so that's my uh, video that's my advice and i hope that's helpful to everybody and i appreciate it and thanks for watching the video and we'll see you in the next video thanks I'm just growing worse on behalf of John and the team at Atwood Construction. So John, if you want to say a little more to the President about how you've seen that experience been? We have to go out the field and survey. 25 years ago, we didn't even know what a cell phone was. We look today and, and, and we can actually uh, just, our life has kind of evolved around the technology. It's life changing. This drone is life changing. Um, we're, we're finding out daily, not in the quarry side of things, but in the construction side of things and other uses. Um, we've actually started two other businesses up off the, the same drone, just using it in a different way. So that's uh, And yet right now drones are becoming very powerful too. I see where they're lifting people. I don't know about the level of safety there, but uh, well, I see that. But also I guess they're gonna be lifting very heavy material at some point. Yeah, there's, uh, there's an initiative uh, with other companies underway to effectively have delivered things done by drone. This drone in particular is about just being able to collect aerial intelligence in a seamless way and being able to deliver that to the user in a way that they weren't able to accomplish before. So John's able to get that work done in literally minutes after the drone flies versus usually it will take him days of just manual labor to be able to accomplish that same work. Fantastic job. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Randall? Yes, Mr. President, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about 5G technology in about two minutes, okay? Uh, guys like Jeff and Mount Darius and other things, drones, autonomous cars are going to require a whole different level of speed and wireless networks. If you come over here, this is a residential neighborhood. If you want to get the kind of speeds required today, these lights are fiber. We have to take fiber to every one of these houses to get that kind of bandwidth. What 5G does, it says forget about all that fiber out here. Get fiber to this, the small cell, which Marcelo is going to show you here. This small cell will broadcast this kind of bandwidth to all these homes, okay? You no longer need to run fiber in here. So you can have speeds that are multiples of what the fastest cable technology can deliver today into the home with wireless technology. If you move into the city, what's happening? If you want to get that bandwidth in there, the same thing. Fiber run to every one of these buildings. It takes a long time digging up roads, bridges, and sidewalks and so forth. 5G. 5G says no longer. In fact, all you need are small cells inside the city. And we can light up these buildings here as well, right? And then as you move to Wi-Fi, we have Wi-Fi deployed in these buildings all over the place. So customers moving in and out of the Wi-Fi range. But you can see the old big cell technology sitting on top of buildings, broadcasting throughout the city. But down the street level, the customer is being put on whatever network gives them the fastest speed. This could be an autonomous car. It could be any number of things. And so the, as the car moves, it gets moved back and forth between the networks into another 5G deployment. And you're getting these kind of multiple gigabit speeds throughout cities without all the fiber having to be deployed into all these buildings. It really accelerates it, makes us get to, uh, to the market much faster. So five years ago, ten years ago, you couldn't have even imagined this. Wouldn't have thought about it. No, sir, we would not have. And this is 2018. We'll deploy in this kind of configuration. And the companies in here are. And in 2020, it becomes mobile. And so this handset will be getting these. So that has to be a tremendous construction saving, ultimately. It's a huge cons uh, construction saving. You don't have to deploy all this fiber. And you see this little cell site here. You're going from deploying these big cell sites and towers to deploying these all over cities. That's what Marcelo is going to show you, what this technology looks like now. So, Mr. President, if I can summarize 5G, it's $275 billion of investment in the next seven years, the creation of 3 million new jobs, and a contribution of $500 billion to the GDP of the United States. Yeah. What is different between 4G and 5G? 4G, those were enormous towers that look quite ugly. We're going to move to deploy millions of this, hundreds of thousands and then millions of small cells all over the United States. The problem that we have is it takes us one year to get a city to give us a permit, but it takes us one hour to install them. And unless we can install them real fast, you know, we're going to lose that leadership that we have today. 
those huge towers will release release now, it's just a small cell, you put this on the, uh, on the utility poles, you put it in the cable strands, and that's all, that's all we need in order to live. When people ask about 5G, but there the must be local permitting. Basically, we run into trouble with cities, municipalities, counties. Each one has its own idea of how much they should charge, how long should it take. How much is the federal permit? How long does it take? Well, this mainly would go down to the cities. Well, we're working quite well with the accessibility of problems with certain cities. There's some cities that take 30 days, there's some cities that take two years, so it's impossible to block into the world. <laughs> so this is why we need to fix this. And that's what 5G, when everybody talks about 5G, well, we can do a recommendation to the cities all over the country to get it going, and Gary, maybe they can move it faster. Because this is truly a great process, but why don't we do a very strong letter of recommendation so they can get it done much faster? And we're doing that all over the country. You know what? Well, uh, you know, uh, the FCC at one time put in place to deploy these kind of cell sites. Yeah, shot clocks. You have 180 days to get a permit done or yeah. something a permit. Something similar. Yeah. Something yeah. To be done. But we're doing that with highways. It would take sometimes 15 to 20 years to get permits to build a small road or a highway. Yeah. And we're going to bring it down, try to bring it down to one year. Yeah. Maximum one year. Yeah. And you have the same thing. This is much easier. So this is really much easier. Believe me. The Great. U.S. is a leader in 4G. We lost 3G, <coughs> and every country, China, Europe, is basically streamlining the process to get there faster. So this will be going into many other countries, yes. by yes. other companies, by you, by no. We, we we only operate in the U.S. And our goal is to basically we want the U.S. to lead 5G because of the speed, because of the job creation. You will if you can get your permits. Absolutely. China yes. has much less trouble getting permits. Okay? Sure. It's actually a <laughs> Hi, this is John in Los Angeles. It's uh, October 22nd, 2017, about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I'm at a park in Dominguez, California here. That was a little religious ceremony they got going down there. So I'm looking around the park, and I'm looking at this. Look at this. This is a microwave cell tower, guys, right out in the open, where anybody can walk up to it. The people are being hit by it that are playing in the park and all this stuff. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the signs here, wide open. Look at this. You can freeze frame the video if you wanna read some of this. I won't stay on it too long, but uh, just take a look at this. Look at this. Yeah, you really wanna salute this. They're microwaving the piss out of us all, and they're disguising it as this. This is what they do. They put the flag on things so you trust it. Well, I don't trust it, all right? Put the flag on things so you trust it. Well, I don't trust it. Tour guide said that one of the reasons they wanted to build the data center in Utah was because of the patriotism of uh, people from Utah. Yeah, that was one of my questions is, uh, you know, why, why did you come here? And his response was, the electricity is cheap and the people are patriotic. And I, I read that as a code word is that nobody's going to ask any questions. And, you know, that, that kind of sat with me uneasily that it, in my opinion, uh, patriotism is questioning your government uh, consistently. The idea that we're just sheep out here and we're not going to care, I think, is, y you know, even though we're a very conservative state, I think a lot of people would bristle at that idea. Put the flag on things so you trust it. Well, I don't trust it. Found one of the most shocking things that I found thus far in all the inspections that I've performed for people so far. And here we are on the roof of an architecture firm in this beautiful space that this person lives in. I'm going to show you the first thing right here. Stay back. Radio frequency energy may exceed exposure limits. This person just found out recently that they have cancer and they've actually been helping their son for the last year or so who's 25 who also has cancer. And I'm going to show you what is behind this building and I'm just, I'm really, really shocked. So here we go, here's this door, and we're gonna just step in here very briefly because it's really intense in here. So these, this is cell phone towers. Look at that. It's just, it's unbelievable. And again, I'll show you the meter. Sitting here right in these people's, right outside these people's driveway. Now this is also extremely hard to believe. I've now driven down almost a full block, right next to the telephone pole, down a full block, and check this out. I'm gonna show you the meter reading, and the meter is still up at two and three volts per meter, in the red, on the left-hand side at the peak, 
Benjamin Rebus has worked on cell phone towers for 14 years. Physically burned my hand. The burn is a work injury you can see. What you see here is what I would call an everyday crime. Other problems he said caused by the towers aren't as easy to spot. Depression, and I got I get headaches from time to time, and uh, mood swings and stuff. Well, here's what I consider, in my personal opinion, another crime scene. And I don't think I'm being dramatic saying this. Here's the cell phone tower. I want you to notice where this is located. Literally in the parking lot right next to these stores. There's human beings working in these stores and eating in these restaurants all day long. And there's a cell phone tower right there. That's hitting a thousand microwatts per square meter, depending on the pulses that are coming off the tower. I'm across the street, as you can see. I wouldn't even want to guess what the radiation exposure is inside of those stores there. And I have the meter set on average, which you can see here it says RMS, which means microwatts per square meter average power density. This is 800, 900 microwatts per square meter. It goes even higher. Once again, biological effects start at 3.4 to 6 microwatts per square meter average power density. 52-year-old Sanjay Kasliwal is counting the days now. Incurable brain cancer due to radiation from mobile phone towers in his neighborhood has reduced life to little more. His brother has been termed luckier sent to the US for brain surgery, but both of them know hope fades. I have written to all possible government offices to find out what sort of control are they doing or what sort of an audit is being done and uh, it seems everything falls on deaf ears, nobody is concerned. Experts say the area the two men live in faces radiation from mobile phone towers equivalent to living in a microwave oven 19 minutes a day. Uh, see, the levels were somewhere between minus 18 to minus 20 to uh, 20 dBm also over here. And the radiation levels are very high for prolonged exposure. For almost about 100 times higher than what is, you know, recommended for continuous safe exposure. And uh, there are two cancer cases which have been reported in this house. There's even a dog has got cancer. Four-year-old Charlotte Holmgren has a bedroom view that nearly everyone in Little Silver, New Jersey is talking about. Do you know what that is? Tower. This cell tower is just 120 feet from her home. I'm scared to death that she's going to wake up with cancer or reproductive issues. Charlotte's mother, Alicia Holmgren, says the 95-foot structure was built within a week in May, smack in the middle of town with seemingly no warning to residents. Homeowners in one Long Island town are preparing for a fight. Two dozen cell phone repeaters installed in front of their homes. It was done legally, but residents say they were never told that it was happening. CBS 2's Carolyn Gustoff reports now from Woodbury. The view from Denise Tufano's Woodbury home abruptly changed last month, towering on her front lawn a cell phone repeater. I could not believe this was actually happening. I said, how could the town permit this? How could they do this to us? She and Woodbury neighbors fuming over the placement of 22 cell repeaters for Verizon in front of homes on what's technically public property without notice or compensation. You couldn't give me $10 million for this, okay? Uh, there are potential health risks to these. Uh, they are aesthetically not pleasing. There's also the devaluation of our home properties. 5G technology promises faster service, but the jury is out on constant exposure to its radio frequency radiation. Five G technology promises faster service, but the jury is out on constant exposure to its radio frequency radiation. Your cell phone you use, you put down. Microwave you use, you stop. This is constant bombardment, and we don't know what uh, is the long term.
is the long-term effects. Residents say their cell service was good enough. Put them in a commercial area. We don't need it. And you know what? We should have at least been asked. I don't think the health of my children is as important as my cell phone service. When CBS2 asked the town of Oyster Bay supervisor why here, he showed up at this protest and was peppered with residents' demands. They have no place in front of homes in residential neighborhoods. Now, what about you, the ones that are already up? The ones that excuse me. New to the post, Joseph Saladino says the town's hands are tied by federal rules that cut local governments out. Town Supervisor Saladino vows to do everything in his power to get these taken down and prevent new ones from going up in front of homes. In his power, the operative words in Woodbury, Long Island, Carolyn Gussoff, CBS 2 News. Verizon tells CBS 2 to keep up with the explosive growth. They need the antennas closer to where people are trying to connect so that they will get better coverage. They claim that the small cells have exposure levels similar to baby monitors and microwave ovens. California City is fighting back at a proposed law that is moving quickly through the legislature. They say it would allow phone companies to put up new antennas in your neighborhood, whether you like it or not. KPX finds Phil Mateer in Walnut Creek. And Phil, today you heard some of the opposition in Sacramento, right? That's right. And a lot of it is based on what you see around us here in Walnut Creek. You're walking down the street in the downtown of your little town, and you maybe one day will look up at a street lamp like this, and sitting on top of it is something totally unexpected a cell phone antenna. Here's the story 5G wireless has the potential to be a game changer. But to pave the way for that game change, telecom companies need to put up between 30,000 and 50,000 of these small cell antennas, including several likely in your town over the next five years, but with only limited local say. Local neighborhoods would be seeing something the size of a refrigerator showing up on a street pole, and they could say nothing to stop it. A library, a school. On traffic signals, on light poles, this would give the companies free reign to install these small cells on any public infrastructure, and we would have no ability to say no. We're also talking about an industry that is a big player in California politics. In the 2016 election cycle, telecommunication companies contribute over $3 million to both California Democrats and Republicans that are now deciding on this bill, which, by the way, shot through committee on a 6-1 vote with two abstentions. It's going to be a tug of war, but it looks like they're going to win, so it's only a matter of time when we're going to be seeing these. By the way, you'll be able to check it all out on the Internet because they're going to make that faster as well. In Walnut Creek, Phil Mateer, KPIX 5. Back to you guys. People living near St. Joseph's Church on Green Bay's south side are voicing their concerns, protesting this morning against a cell phone tower that will be built on church grounds. Protesters of this tower say there are several reasons they do not want the tower to be built there, including what they say are health risks, lowering the value of their property and messing with televisions and radios on their homes. A staff member of the Quad Parishes told us some of the reasons the church agreed to having the cell phone tower on its property including financial benefits. Um, provide better cell phone coverage. And nowadays everybody has a cell phone. So that's one of the main things. It will be an evangelization tool for us. It's going to be a clock tower and it will have our church name on all four sides, um, a cross on the top lit up so that people will know that there's a church here. It's a terrible location to put up a 140-foot tall cell phone tower. Willoughby Hills residents like Dan Valerian say they were stunned to learn their mayor approved a massive cell tower to be built here at this location on River Road without them even knowing it. A location residents say is all wrong. The beauty of the Chagrin Valley on one side, residential areas all around you, a historic cemetery, a historic building, and you're just going to wedge this thing right in the middle of all that. And some Willoughby Hills council members say the mayor broke the law by approving the project. And to find out that the mayor had signed it months before the first meeting was held, I think that's just wrong. And frankly, at our December meeting, we asked the mayor not once but twice, did you sign any agreement with Verizon or the representatives? He said no both times. Did you sign this lease without consulting residents? Yes, I did. Did you sign this lease without consulting residents? Yes, I did. Mayor Robert Weger admitted he approved 
approve the project without talking to residents, but told me city council was in on the deal. A deal that could have Willoughby Hills facing a lawsuit if it doesn't follow through. It's got to go through two readings at the uh, Planning Commission, and that hasn't happened yet. Reporting here in Willoughby Hills, I'm News 5 investigator Joe Paganakis. Residents in one of El Paso's oldest neighborhoods are speaking out against a proposed cell phone tower. KFOX 14 News at 9's Megan Lopez attended a Sunset Heights community meeting tonight to find out why they're so opposed to it. She joins us live in the studio to explain why residents say they don't want the tower. Megan. Robert, people who live in the Sunset Heights Historic District say the 60-foot tall tower will be an eyesore. They say it doesn't belong in their community. The president of the Sunset Heights Neighborhood Improvement Association, Cito Negron, says the tower and the city is currently considering whether it wants to, uh, it wants to let Crown Castle build that tower for Verizon Wireless. These are some artistic renderings of what that tower could look like. Negron says that the company offered designs that would look like a boot knee structure to disguise the tower so it would resemble a UTEP design. But some of the residents I spoke with tonight say that's not enough. Now they talked about disguising it to look like a UTEP tower, you know? But this is not UTEP. This is Sunset Heights. If they want to put that over there by UTEP, you know, that's their decision. It's not consistent with the uh, integrity of the historic nature of the neighborhood. It might not be to the benefit of anybody but the cell carrier and the property owner. Um, it's definitely not to the benefit of the neighborhood. Aside from being an eyesore, Negron tells me that the company has to get special permission to build that tower in that area because it's so close to some houses. Tonight, Sunset Heights residents met at Hal Marcus Gallery to discuss their options. Some have sent letters to the city's planning commission to ask for another area to be chosen for that tower. The city's planning commission is set to hear the cell phone tower proposal tomorrow afternoon. Reporting live, Megan Lopez, KFOX 14 News. Every new generation of wireless networks delivers faster speeds and more functionality to our smartphones. 1G brought us the very first cell phones, 2G let us text for the first time, 3G brought us online, and 4G delivered the speeds that we enjoy today. But as more users come online, 4G networks have just about reached the limit of what they're capable of at a time when users want even more data for their smartphones and devices. Now we're headed toward 5G, the next generation of wireless. It will be able to handle a thousand times more traffic than today's networks, and it'll be up to 10 times faster than 4G LTE. Just imagine downloading an HD movie in under a second, and then let your imagination run wild. Wild. 5G will be the foundation for virtual reality, autonomous driving, the Internet of Things, and stuff we can't even yet imagine. But what exactly is a 5G network? The truth is, experts can't tell us what 5G actually is because they don't even know yet. Your smartphone and other electronic devices in your home use very specific frequencies on the radio frequency spectrum, typically those under 6 gigahertz. But these frequencies are starting to get more crowded. Carriers can only squeeze so many bits of data on the same amount of radio frequency spectrum. As more devices come online, we're going to start to see slower service and more dropped connections. The solution is to open up some new real estate. So researchers are experimenting with broadcasting on shorter millimeter waves, those that fall between 30 and 300 gigahertz. This section of spectrum has never been used before for mobile devices, and opening it up means more bandwidth for everyone. But there is a catch. Millimeter waves can't travel well through buildings or other obstacles, and they tend to be absorbed by plants and rain. To get around this problem, we'll need technology number two, small cell networks. Today's wireless networks rely on large, high-powered cell towers to broadcast their signals over long distances. But remember, higher frequency millimeter waves have a harder time traveling through obstacles, which means if you move behind one, you lose your signal. Small cell networks would solve that problem using thousands of low-power mini base stations. These base stations would be much closer together than traditional towers, forming a sort of relay team to transmit signals around obstacles. 
We know people are already getting sick from the lower frequencies, and we expect, that is our scientists expect, that these higher, ultra-high frequency uh, microwaves are going to bring people to disease quicker and in a more intense form. The other problem with 5G technology is these microwaves are very short. So our old microwaves were about two and a half to three feet long. These are now about an inch to half an inch long. And they don't travel very well. So they're going to have to put a little cell tower transmitter in front of about every two to ten homes. Now this is a big problem because we know that cancer rates around regular cell towers are about three or four times what they normally should be. We also know that there's neurological symptoms that increase as you get closer and closer to a cell tower. Now these new transmitters are going to be placed close to people's homes. Um, it's going to be continuous exposure as with other cell towers, but it'll be emitting a much more higher frequency, high intensity wireless radiation. But laurels are not good resting places, so I think we have to start moving on 5G. Because today, the bulk of our spectrum activity when it comes to mobile takes place at 3 gigahertz or below. But going forward, we are going to have to bust through that ceiling all the way up to 24 gigahertz and perhaps even as high as 90 gigahertz. We are going to have to look to infinity and beyond. And then we're going to have to combine those stratospheric frequencies with dense networks of small cells. And if we do that right, we will have higher speeds with our wireless networks than we have ever seen before. And I think that is what 5G is going to look like. And I think we need to get moving because the rest of the world is already on to this. Brothers and sisters in Christ, stay watchful, stay vigilant, stay sober-minded. Have an awesome day, guys. God bless. To broadcast the entire Earth, it takes two kilowatts, two hair dryers. Now a microwave oven uses a thousand watts or one kilowatt. Here's the damage one kilowatt can be done by somebody when they take a magnetron out of a microwave and turn it into a ray gun. This is just a small example of a low-tech weapon running on 1,000 watts. Then you have these things here, these huge towers of death. Now each row in this tower, an array, or a set of dishes or rectennas or whatever you want to call them, is connected to a cable with a maximum power output of 300,000 watts, or 300 kilowatts. That's 300 microwave ovens. We base that conservative estimate based on the gauge of the cabling that's running up to one of these arrays. They're estimated at 300,000 watts per cable. Those aren't fiber optic cables running up to those arrays. It's a thick copper gauge transmission line quality cable running up those towers. Now if there's 10 cables, that's like 3 megawatts of power. And these cables are out there to output power to the magnetron, not for data transfer. That's an important point. These cell phone towers are weaponized. There's no other reason to have this much power running up the cables. It isn't for data transfer. Now FCC regulations limit normal transmission per array to about 400 watts. To put that into perspective, one watt from your phone can go 25 miles to the nearest tower. A 1000 watt magnetron on a stick can blow shit up. And these towers have a 300 kilowatt power line running up to each rectenna. And who knows, there could be an amplifier at the top of these towers that steps up the power even more. The point is here, ladies and gentlemen, is that these companies like Lucent and Google could turn up the juice at any time and nuke a town. They could nuke the entire country without any warning. Without these service personnel playing the role of an unruly mob at George's Moody Air Force Base are about to fall prey to an invisible ray. The hulking panel atop this Humvee is part of what the U.S. military calls the Active Denial System, or ADS. It's designed to incapacitate enemy combatants with an unnerving, non-lethal sensation of intense heat. Watch as the ray silently strikes and scatters the crowd. The active denial system has three great characteristics. First of all, it's safe. Second, it's effective. And third, it has a tremendous range compared to the other non-lethal weapons that today's warfighter has. 
This is the heart of this 100 kilowatt transmitter. This is the gyrotron. 200 kilowatts of uh, electricity is fed in and 100 kilowatts of radio frequency comes out. That millimeter wave energy comes out an aperture underneath the main reflector, hits the subreflector, which illuminates that main reflector and sends a roughly antenna sized beam downrange. Those holes that you see in the antenna are for the cameras and other visual equipment that the operator uses so that he knows exactly where that beam is going. It's operated by a joystick. The operator looks into the console, sees exactly what that antenna is aimed at, moves the joystick left, antenna slews to the left, same way to the right. Then when there's an individual who's identified as a troublemaker, he has a cursor, he can put that cursor on that individual, pull the trigger that's on the joystick, and the energy is sent downrange at the speed of light. The electromagnetic radiation released by the active denial system is similar to the microwaves in your microwave oven, in that it causes the water molecules in the target to become excited and heat up. But that's where the similarity ends. The ADS is designed to heat only the very surface of the skin. It does this by outputting only the carefully chosen radio wave frequency of 95 gigahertz. Even though it can easily penetrate clothing, the ADS generates a much shorter and safer wavelength of radio waves than those used in microwave ovens. The active denial system millimeter wave directed energy beam reaches 1 64th of an inch into human skin. So that is the most outermost layer of the skin, roughly equivalent to about three sheets of notebook paper. It is essentially affecting the pain nerves in the outermost layer of the skin, heating them up and causing an immediate repel effect. Even these stoic servicemen, aware of what's about to happen, engage, can't help but flinch when they feel the heat. This is the first time I've experienced the uh, beam from the active denial system, and it uh, feels like an intense warmth feeling, uh, kind of similar to opening a uh, very hot oven door, and it's a compelling feeling that you want to get out of the way of this beam. If you were not expecting this, it would very definitely shock you and make you want to move. The ADS represents just the latest effort to devise an effective ray weapon. Talking about post-human society. That's right, you heard that correctly, post-human after human, when man merges with machine, when man will be no more. That is their end game, to wipe out humanity, where resistance is futile. That kind of thing, that's what they're thinking about. That's what they want to bring into the world. And that brings us back to what we were talking about yesterday, the weaponization of cell phone towers. To recap that discussion, a cell phone tower is a giant microwave oven on a stick. Cell phone towers use a magnetron or an oscillator like a microwave oven to make microwaves. That's how they communicate. Radars use the very same technology. That part that's beaming into the dish is a magnetron. Just like a microwave oven and just like a cell phone tower. Cell phone service is still spotty. Companies like Verizon are using temporary microwave technology. Companies like Verizon are using temporary microwave technology to help people connect. It's kind of interesting when cell phone tower workers are telling you that they have headaches, that they have brain cancer, that they have all these health issues throughout the day where they get these headaches or blurry vision. Why would so many of these guys have these seemingly often problems like this? It, it, you would think that um, if there was nothing really bad about cell phone towers, that obviously those who would work on these towers would be fine. But instead you hear something quite different. And with the, the readouts with this, a thousand plus microwatts per square meter measured near one of these cell phone towers, when it only takes about 10 microwatts to even have any effect on you. So we're talking 100 times the, the threshold for where it actually can cause harm to a person. So it's very interesting, you know. Some people have mentioned that when they've lived near cell phone towers that they've, they've had uh, headaches and depression. And, and this is also 
something that these these tower workers have mentioned as well having even depression from doing this so this also begs the question of whether or not these patents I've shown in a previous video really are something that is being used on some of these towers to where it can actually influence you these frequencies that they use can cause certain types of emotions and certain types of feelings at certain frequencies it, it makes you even potentially depressed feeling and in other frequencies it can cause you to even become enraged and why is there so many cell phone towers and in many cases these cell phone towers if you put your cell phone directly towards them in the range and it doesn't do anything you go look up the cell phone tower online it says it's for this certain particular company let's say sprint you go and take your phone over to it and you have no bars it doesn't even make any sense or even have some of these cell phone towers multiples in a row why would you have so many in a row what what's the relevance of that it's supposed to be covering certain square footage allegedly but instead we have them lined up near a highway why would they be doing that especially not very far apart so it makes you kind of wonder what they're really for here Just make today everyone knows the government agencies are corrupt it's common sense it's clear that the system is broken and they're all crossing the line homeland security irs the usda the treasury the epa all of it bs but rarely is it so blatant as it is with the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, because, well, very, very few people pay attention at all to them. Hardly any resistance was put up against net neutrality rules, and that was a fairly big media story. Almost no one said anything about the mergers between the giant telecoms and the general complete takeover of communications. There really wasn't any resistance to the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which opened up a whole can of worms, a whole set of Pandora's boxes with the NSA and everyone else. But now they've opened up the floodgates to massive corporate control over our lives, a total surveillance system on the part of government agencies and their contractors, and the very near blanketing of the entire population. Literally, of everyone in the world. Literally, of everyone in the world. Autonomous vehicles, smart city energy grids, transportation networks, and water systems. Immersive education and entertainment will come from the cloud. The driving force of the 21st century will be powerful processing centralized in the cloud and wirelessly connected to thin clients. All of whom will be saturated with gigahertz signals literally everywhere they go on the planet and no one has permission. The United States will be the first country in the world to open up high band spectrum for 5G networks and applications. And that's damn important. And will generate tens of billions of dollars in economic activity. Big surprise, since this FCC chairman, now a former chairman, who was appointed by Obama, big surprise, since he used to be the president of two industry lobbyist organizations, Tom Wheeler was formerly president of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association and the CEO of the Cellular Telecom and Internet Association. Chairman Wheeler put the entire fixed and global broadband industry under a stricter regulatory regime. He has done so many things that have angered his former employees at, employers at the NCTA and CTIA have sued the FCC during his tenure. He explains his actions by saying, I used to be an advocate for corporate interests, and I hope I was a good one. But today, my client is the American people, and I want to be the best damn advocate for the American people that I can be. So he represents the industry. He got appointed to the position, and he just fox and hen house the whole thing. He just prostituted it all. So it's no wonder that he gives a no-holds-barred, full-force push to usher in 5G 
everywhere upon everyone, to swiftly and fully silence any and all dissenters, to ignore all the real questions, and to make sure that the safety data, to make sure that safety studies don't even happen. Unlike some countries, we do not believe that we should spend the next couple of years studying what 5G should be or how it should operate. We won't wait for the standards. Turning innovators loose is far preferable to expecting committees and regulators to define the future. And to make sure that questions about the biological effects of non-ionizing radiation are kept to an absolute minimum, off the table, out of the public eye, and nowhere near the FCC conversation. How many people have to die from brain cancer before the federal government puts warning labels on cell phones? It's time to tell the American public the truth. Wireless causes cancer and killing hundreds of young care. Because they're going to rubber stamp this thing right through, no doubt about it. They already have. And what else would you expect from a lobbyist? The trade-off gives total power to these companies, to various government agencies, and to anyone in between who's interested in spying, hackers. It opens it up for everyone. And as technology races forward in what is already a world dominated by cell phones and people looking lost into little screens, it will now be completely saturated with high-speed connections. The next generation of wireless must be mobile fiber. 10 to 100 times faster than what we're used to today. We need to speed the deployment of 5G here on our shores. Yes, 5G will connect the internet of everything. If something can be connected, it will be connected in the 5G world. Of hundreds of billions of microchips connected in products from pill bottles to plant waterers, you can be sure of only one thing. The biggest Internet of Things application has yet Every to be single imagined. device and appliance and manufacturer is being fitted with a two way communication device and it sends data back. Spying and surveillance is completely built in. It's a total default and it's the given. Location tracking, health data, audio and visual recordings, text, and everything else is going to be continually collected. And Tom Wheeler of the FCC freely admits it. He thinks it's great because it's going to make everything faster and it's going to make more money. We take our most significant step yet down the path to our 5G future. Others have covered it as well, but this is an issue that is not well known enough. 5G is a huge upgrade to the system. It is a complete overhaul compared with 3G and 4G. It's not only dramatically faster speeds, which is what they're going to play up to sell it to consumers and tell everyone what a great convenience and advancement that it is, but it is also a literal, complete infrastructure overhaul. Now, to make this work, five, the 5G build-out is going to be very infrastructure-intensive, requiring massive deployment of small cells. The big game-changer is that 5G will use much higher frequency bands than previously thought viable for mobile broadband and other applications. Such millimeter wave signals have physical properties that are both a limitation and a strength. They tend to travel best in narrow and straight lines, and they do not go through physical objects as well. This means that very narrow signals in an urban environment tend to bounce around buildings and other obstacles, making it difficult to connect to a moving point. But brilliant engineers have developed new antennas that can aim and amplify signals, coupled with sophisticating pro sophisticated processing that allows a moving device to pick up all of the signals that are bouncing around and create one coherent connection. They're going to put up boxes on telephone poles, or at least that's what the articles have said, and they're going to be on ground level sites and everywhere else, and it will completely replace the now obsolete cell towers that you've seen around and you've got used to seeing. Those are obsolete. These are coming in very quickly. The cell phone and wireless companies are spending billions of dollars. They're racing the complete installation of the system by 2020. 
and that's now only three years away. Verizon and AT&T tell us they'll begin deploying 5G trials in 2017. The first commercial deployments they're talking about are expected in 2020. They're fueling money into cities and private owners where the towers will be installed. They're paying them off, and they're moving so fast that there's going to be very few places that are free at all anymore. I don't want to add paranoia. I don't want to make people fearful. But basically, where can you run from this? Once the system is fully launched and up, it's, it's going to be just like the Terminator Genesis system. It, it's going to be the rise of AI, and it's going to be like there's no looking back. We must reject the notion that the 5G future will be the sole providence of urban areas. The 5G revolution will touch all corners of our country. We are the pioneers of a new spectrum frontier. No one gave permission for this because most people don't fully understand what's happening or why it matters. They're going to click on little agreements on their cell phone for the different sites they visit, and they're going to have no idea how much is going to be taken from that. But it's clear that this is not a good bargain. And people need to be warned. They should try to oppose this in their local cities and where they can and try to challenge these companies because they don't want to face resistance and they don't want a population that knows about the dangers and the risks of this technology. But the capabilities of this technology are absolutely unfathomable. I can't cover it all in this video. Go look it up for yourself. Now, I'm not going to get into Dr. Ross a day of UCLA right now, do a more in-depth video later on, or a lot of the other brain doctors and neurological researchers, but Ross a day was working with the CIA and exchanging technology and study data with the Russians uh, back in the 60s and 70s and even further back, and he figured out scientifically, demonstratively, how non-ionizing radiation at various specific frequencies from microwaves or from other signals, how they could alter human and animal behavior. For instance, a simple 10 hertz wave could put someone into a stupor within a couple of minutes using neuroelectric devices that they developed uh, in, by the 70s. They could put individuals or entire towns to sleep on command. They can aggravate people. They can alter their sexual preferences. They could delete their memories. They could turn on desire. They could turn on repulsion. And they could otherwise hijack someone's spontaneous and natural behavior. They could literally hijack your nervous system and your brain. And that was 30 or 40 years ago. Now things are very advanced, they're very precise, and they're very far along. There's discussions now at the Davos World Economic Forum that have broached the topic of mind reading and literal mind control. And these devices, the capability to do it, is built into everything. Every handheld unit, every laptop, mobile device that everyone's carrying around. And once things are fast enough with 5G, <laughs> all bets are off. The constant ubiquitous connection with these next generation 5G towers. I mean, what else can you say? You either see it or you don't. Research undertaken in Denmark has shown that plants placed too close to Wi-Fi routers have trouble growing. The experiment was performed by a group of ninth graders after their proposal to monitor the effects of sleeping by a cell phone was rejected due to the lack of sufficient resources. Undaunted, they switched their focus to the more attainable goal of assessing the impact that router radiation from Wi-Fi had on plants. The group planted 12 containers of garden crest seeds and placed half in a room near two Wi-Fi devices and the other half in a separate room with no such gadgets. For 12 days, they monitored the progress of the seeds by photographing, weighing, and measuring them. By the end of the test duration, the results were clear. The seeds that were placed near the router had died or not grown as usual, while the others had begun to flourish. The teacher who oversaw the experiment assured critics that the two specimens were watered and cared for in the same manner. Their discovery has gotten the attention of a professor at the Karolinska Institute who plans to carry out a similar test, but in a more controlled environment. You may sign up to speak. You may please leave. Please leave the room. Thank you. Please leave. Shame on you! Tempers seemed to flare at the county school board meeting. This, as board members heard from the public, about putting up a cell tower on the grounds of Shadyside Elementary School. You are the deciders. The process started here, the process tracks here, the process ends here. Those opposed to the cell tower, some of them parents, say they have long-term health concerns. They were counting on the board to take action by casting a vote, even though it was only a review item. 
As board members, please protect our children. We absolutely need you today to be brave. Even as both sides lined up to be heard, it was evident there was still plenty of frustration. That's when the board had to call in security. It's time for you to leave. Thank you. I will. Thank you. There was public support for the Shady Side cell tower from residents who tried to convince the board of the benefits. With the current storms brewing in the Atlantic this week, I think about safety. Will my cell phone work if I call for help? I think about safety. Will my cell phone work if I call for help or try to let my family know that I'm okay? Please do not let the financial agenda of these small few in our community bully this board into backing out of this plan. One board member called for a vote on the issue, even though he realized the item was only up for review. Motion fails at this time. That said, the cell tower proposal, now out of the hands of the school board, awaits an official permit. Now looking beyond Shady Side, there are two other pending cell phone tower proposals, one of them on the grounds of school board headquarters. So what's the financial benefit? Last year, the school system collected a little more than $81,000. Live in the studio, Tim Tootin, WBAL, TV 11 News. Of all the places in Shadyside, why are you trying to put a cell phone tower in my kid's playground? There's like a thousand other places you can put a cell phone tower. This is the, this is ground zero for the best possible opportunity to create, I understand, this is not our but the point I'm making is this. You're asking why I can't go somewhere else, right? You're asking why can't I go like a mile away or two miles away? Yeah, you're just saying, like, the answer is like this is the best place to fill a hole in the network. You're asking, why can't I go like a mile away or two miles away? Yeah, you're just saying, like, the answer is, this is the best place to fill a hole in the network. Really? There's really, there's really everywhere else in Shadyside. You're trying to tell me, everywhere else in Shadyside, you can't get more than 200 feet from a building or somebody's property line or whatever. That's what you're trying to tell me? And will you be guaranteed, will we be guaranteed that the school is, that is, the cell tower is safe for us kids? and we won't get any some some sort of cancer or anything like that cuz i don't want cancer can I ask what grade you in? what what grade are you in fifth you're in fifth grade yeah okay. going into fifth when my son was 9 years old in the third grade he was diagnosed with leukemia he went to a school where there was a cell tower Please. within 3 or 400 feet from his elementary school, his Forest Hill Elementary School in Fairfax County. So, if there's anyone who can understand your concern, it's me. Because I'm a, I'm a parent of a child who had cancer and survived cancer. And, and, and I can tell you, I can tell you that there, there is no credible evidence to demonstrate that my son got cancer from that cell tower. that there, there is no credible evidence to demonstrate that my son got cancer from that cell tower. Because, because the reality is that there's no evidence to show that that was harm. And I wouldn't be able to do these And And I can tell you, I can tell you that there, there is no credible evidence to demonstrate that my son got cancer from that cell tower. Because, because the reality is that there's no evidence to show that that was harm. And I wouldn't be able to do these 
Companies and cell tower will go up in Appleton. A judge ruled in favor of the company last week. But the city of Appleton and nearby neighbors are not happy with that decision. Fox 11's Alexis Santos has this Fox 11 follow-up. It just doesn't belong there. Neighbors near a proposed Verizon cell tower in Appleton are disappointed with a judge's decision to allow the company to build. At the end of the day, nobody should be allowed to build a cell tower that close to a residential area. The city of Appleton tried to stop it. The Common Council denied the permit for constructing the tower because of concerns from neighbors about safety and loss of property values. They came forward and they really laid out their case. It was a pretty powerful case. So um, council said, no, see what happens. We'll take our chances. In August, Verizon sued the city of Appleton over that decision. Outagamie County Judge Nancy Krieger ruled in favor of Verizon's claim that Appleton didn't provide enough evidence to support that permit denial, and those grounds are not valid for denying a permit. We're definitely pleased with the outcome, and, and for us it really comes down to, to public safety. For um, and, and for us it really comes down to, to public safety. And, and, and I can tell you, I can tell you, that there, there is no credible evidence to demonstrate that my son got cancer from that cell tower. Because, because the reality is that there's no evidence to show the cause of harm. And I wouldn't put a big piece of the And for us, it really comes down to, to public safety. Verizon says it wanted to fill in gaps in coverage in the Appleton area and also make sure people could use their phones in case of an emergency. I think about safety. Will my cell phone work if I call for help or try to let my family know that I'm okay? My name is Chuck Grodens with Computer Care Clinic. One of the most frequent questions we get here in our service is, how can I resolve my Wi-Fi troubleshooting problems? People lose signal or a device stops connecting. So I decided in order to answer that question with any authority, I needed to look a little bit further into this whole Wi-Fi thing. What is it? How does it work? What type of signals are being broadcast? Are they directional? How much power do you need? And then I thought about it as I was doing this research. Well, what are the effects of these things, these Wi-Fi transmitters? What type of radio frequencies do they use? How much power uh, do they need? And where are they? And how are they affecting us, if in any way at all? So. Uh, this video is going to be a little bit longer than our usual tip of the day, but it's going to explore Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi signals, and we'll dig into a little bit of radio frequency, too, just in case you forgot or you were sleeping during your physics classes in high school. So let's dig into Wi-Fi, find out the myths and the truths, and, and hopefully we'll have a better idea and handle on how to troubleshoot our Wi-Fi problems. <laughs> Let's first look in an oversimplified view of the electromagnetic field or EMF radiation spectrum. EMF radiation can be classified from very low frequency, which has a long wavelength, to very high frequency, which has a short wavelength. The sound waves humans can hear are a form of very low frequency EMF radiation. With one single electromagnetic wave cycle or wavelength longer than a football field, on the high frequency end, you can find things like X-rays and gamma rays with a wavelength smaller than an atom. Radio waves and microwaves are forms of electromagnetic energy that are collectively described by the term radio frequency or RF. RF emissions are discussed in terms of energy, radiation, or fields. Radiation is defined as energy traveling through the air in the form of waves or particles. Electromagnetic radiation can be described as waves of electric and magnetic energy moving together or radiating through space. These radiation waves are generated by the movement of electrical charges through a conductive metal object like an antenna. For example, the movement of energy in a radio or television or cellular base station antenna generates electromagnetic waves that radiate away from the antenna and are eventually intercepted by a receiving antenna, such as your rooftop TV antenna, a car radio antenna, or an antenna integrated into a handheld device, such as a cellular telephone. Frequency is the number of electromagnetic waves passing any given point in one second. For example, a typical radio wave transmitted by your favorite FM radio station has a wavelength of about 
10 feet or 3 meters in a frequency of about 100 million cycles or waves per second, known as 100 megahertz. So your favorite FM radio station sends about 100 million 10-foot-long RF electromagnetic waves into the air every second. That's a lot of waves. Telecommunication services cannot exist without EMF. Microwave ovens, commercial heating, manufacturing, diagnostic medical services, some medical techniques, and radar are also uses of RF energy. There's also natural RF produced by Earth and space. So we're surrounded by radiation. EMF radiation is classified as non-ionizing or ionizing. Ionizing EMF radiation, like certain UV rays and X-rays, can break chemical bonds, which is not great. That means they can cause cell damage in living things, which is obviously bad for us. RF radiation, as found in radio, TV, cell phone, and Wi-Fi transmissions, is considered non-ionizing. Some sort of EMF radiation is emitted by all technical equipment or devices that produce electromagnetic fields. It's basically anything that gets plugged in or runs on a battery. Power lines, radar systems, communication towers, cell phones, cordless phones, Wi-Fi routers, iPads, TVs, computers, gaming consoles, they all produce some sort of EMF radiation. Well, here's where it gets interesting. All EMF radiation has an effect on the human body. But the question is whether it's a negligible effect or a negative effect, and to what degree. Microwaves are a specific category of radio waves. They can be defined as radio frequency radiation with frequencies from several hundred megahertz to several gigahertz or thousands of megahertz. One of the most familiar and widespread uses of microwave energy is found in household microwave ovens, which operate at a frequency of about 2,450 megahertz or 2.45 gigahertz. Sound familiar? That's right. Almost the same frequency your microwave oven uses to heat your food is also used for most cordless phones and Wi-Fi routers. Technically, Wi-Fi channels typically range from 2.412 gigahertz to about 2.472 gigahertz, right in that spectrum. So you might think, aha, that's where my Wi-Fi interference is coming from, my microwave oven. But not so fast. Most microwave ovens are well shielded and will not emit enough radiation to interfere with wireless communications even when they're on. If your microwave is, say, very old or was dropped or damaged in a move, it might have a damaged shield. To be safe, it's probably a good idea to replace it. If you have doubts about your wireless equipment and interference, you could upgrade that wireless networking equipment and your cordless phone devices to the newer 5 gigahertz band which is way above the 2.4, as long as your wireless devices all support it. Research continues on the possible effects of exposure to RF and microwave radiation. 2.4 gigahertz, as we learned, is far from ionizing radiation, the type that can quickly harm human tissue and cause bad things like cancer. But you can't see or feel any radiation. And what's scary is the long-term effects of exposure to radiation might not appear for several months or even years. It's widely thought the principal effect of non-ionizing radiation, like microwaves, is an increase in the temperature of water in our bodies. Theoretically, it would take an unlikely amount of microwave energy to cause harm to a human body. But as scientists are beginning to study the effects more closely, some people are beginning to change their minds. In 2011, the WHO International Agency for Research on Cancer classified radio frequency electromagnetic fields as possibly carcinogenic to humans, based on an increased risk for glioma, a malignant type of brain cancer associated with wireless phone use. You probably heard about that in the news. Also, two areas of the body, the eyes and the testes, are known to be particularly vulnerable to heating by RF energy because of the relative lack of available blood flow to dissipate the excessive heat. Laboratory experiments have shown that 30 minutes to one hour of considerably high levels of RF radiation, now we're talking 100 to 200 milliwatts per centimeter squared, which is a tremendous amount of energy, can cause cataracts in rabbits. Temporary sterility caused by such effects as changes in sperm count and in sperm mobility is possible after exposures of the testes to high level RF radiation. So if you're thinking about having children, fellas, you might want to remove that cell phone from your front pocket. 
The good news is that typical environmental levels of RF energy routinely encountered by the general public are far below levels necessary to produce significant heating and increased body temperature. But there may be situations, particularly workplace environments near high-powered RF sources, where recommended limits for safe exposure of human beings to RF energy could be exceeded. More recently, other scientific laboratories in North America, Europe, and elsewhere have reported certain biological effects after exposure of animals and animal tissue to relatively low levels of RF radiation. These reported effects have included certain changes in the immune system, neurological effects, behavioral effects, evidence for a link between microwave exposure and the action of certain drugs and compounds, an effect in brain tissue, and effects on DNA. Some studies have also examined the possibility of a link between RF and microwave exposure and cancer. Results to date have been inconclusive. Microwave exposure, when you think about it, is fairly new, but it's growing quickly. Dr. Magda Havas makes some great points regarding our lack of experience with the effects of non-ionizing radiation since it's relatively recent. Cell phones have been around for nearly 30 years, but only becoming widespread in the last 10 since smartphones took off. Wi-Fi has been a thing for nearly 15 years now, growing slowly, but now it's everywhere. And smart meters installed by your local electric company have been transmitting pulses of pretty concerning power for about five years, causing a lot of people to take notice. It takes quite a while to formulate a statistically significant health finding, and up to now, there's not a whole lot of evidence or research. Also, Dr. Magdus notes that human exposure to radiation used to be intermittent, but now it's more constant than ever. Wi-Fi routers emit a beacon signal that is continuous as long as the device is powered on. In other words, you don't have to be connected to the Internet to be exposed to the radiation generated by a wireless router. When information is either uploaded or downloaded, the radiation levels increase both at the router and at the computer. The same is true for cordless phones and wireless baby monitors. Voice-activated baby monitors and cordless phones that radiate only when in use are available in Europe, but not currently available widely in North America. Now, some people are more sensitive to EMF than others, suffering from a recently discovered affliction known as electronic hypersensitivity. They used to just think these people are crazy, but now they're finding that symptoms including unexplained fatigue, sleep disturbances, headaches, feeling of discomfort, difficulty concentrating, depression, memory loss, visual disruptions, irritability, hearing disruptions, ringing in the ears, skin problems, heart palpitations, and irregular heartbeat, dizziness, loss of appetite, movement difficulties, and nausea may all be symptoms of electronic hypersensitivity. When electrically hypersensitive people go into an electromagnetically clean environment, many of their symptoms seem to diminish or disappear. Studies predict by 2017, almost 50% of the population may be complaining of this illness. Some countries are already withdrawing Wi-Fi from public areas and even creating radiation-free refuges for people with electrosensitivity. The bottom line on RF radiation and its effect on us well, the jury is still out, but it's not looking great. In the meantime, until we all know for sure, it might be prudent to take a few precautionary steps. Fortunately, it's pretty easy to avoid most microwave radiation in high doses. Move wireless routers and cell phones further away from people. The further they are away, the less RF you'll absorb. Use headphones or the speakerphone when you talk on your phone to keep it away from your brain. Don't sleep with your cell phone under your pillow. Don't put your cell phone in your pockets. And turn things off when you're not using them. Unplug your Wi-Fi router and turn off your phone if you absolutely don't need it at night. So what levels of RF radiation are considered safe and what kinds of levels are typical? We did some of our own testing with an x 480836 EMF meter in a typical home and office scenario. And here's what we found. So we took some readings at our store and at our home. First, we started at our store. Sorry for the messy workshop back here. And we got close to the wireless router and found that we had some uh, spikes up to 0.6 microwatts per cubic centimeter, which is pretty high. So 
The question is, we still don't know what this stuff is doing to us, but there's some pretty cool charts at bioinitiative.org citing scientific studies that have already happened, and they have lots of easy-to-read colorful charts with the potential effects of electromagnetic radiation in the human body. Again, these are in proven to be long-term studies. Stuff's still kind of new. This is interesting, too. If you look at these um, smart meters that everybody's fussing about, I didn't think it was such a big deal until I took the readings myself. And looking at a peak of 37.28, and and that's pretty heavy. I mean, that's a lot of power. Now, it's pulsed energy. It's not constant. But this might be hitting you in your bedroom or at your place of work, depending on the location of this thing. And, of course, I'm right on top of it here. But if you look at it, you get immune system effects of that type of radiation. So you need to be concerned of nothing else. We don't know if it's causing any cancer or immune system effects with a pulsed rate like that. Your body does a really good job of healing itself. Also, the microwave ovens, if you get really close, nobody would do this, would stand in front of a microwave oven, but there's considerable amount of energy coming out of a microwave oven. And you're looking at some of the effects that could here, including altered cell membranes. Of course, you wouldn't stand in front of a microwave oven. Most people have more sense than that. Although there is shielding inside, if you get right up on it, there are still some waves, microwaves that do escape that shielding. So you want to make sure you're backed out. And you see if I pull away and even leave the room, it gets back to more of a background radiation. Again, this is in our store we've got wi-fi waves and microwaves flying all over the place in here now this is just my laptop and you can see as it's sending and receiving information it's jacked up to about 0.2 point three and you can see that there are some uh, possible neurological effects and that's constant that's what we're probably doing sitting at our desk every day or at home and even having these laptops on our laps for the gentlemen especially it could affect sterility so if you're having a problem having kids you might want to double check your electronic devices now my wife was on a phone call and look at this spiking at seven microwatts per cubic centimeter and that's it's huge I mean, it doesn't do it all the time we have a pretty crappy signal we have Verizon in our house and unfortunately we're a little far off the beaten path so uh I understand the further are you away, the more energy your phone has to use to to acquire that signal. As I pull this away from her cell phone while she's on an active call, and this doesn't happen all the time, just when you're on a telephone call, and it's a little less for Wi-Fi, you can see that uh, it gets kind of jacked up uh, periodically. Not all the time, but, I mean, these are significant numbers here, this 3 and 4, and you can see on the chart here what this does, even up to 7, and again, this is more constant than the pulsed energy we're looking at. So if you spend a lot of time on the phone, uh, you might have some questions about what is this stuff doing? It's a relatively new phenomenon, only the last decade or so, so we don't have a whole lot of information. We are the guinea pigs, my friends. So take some precautions and uh, just be careful. It's better to be safe than be sorry. My name is Chuck Fresh. Please like and subscribe and tell your friends about this video too. Hey, we might all learn something if we put our heads together and put your findings in the comments below, please. We'd like to know what you're experiencing um, with uh, microwave and RF um, frequency radiation. Thanks again for watching.